good seeing you here. Uh, most of it hopefully parked back there, away from the ice. It's, uh, but I praise the Lord that we're here, right? Able to do two services today. I uh, want to welcome any first time visitors. Don't see any first time visitors. Uh, we have a visitor's card on the bulletin. Uh, we are still doing a 10 and 11 a.m. service on WebEx, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, we also have uh, Wednesday, we have the uh, Bible study and uh, one, and the one is at 6.30, Bible study, we're still doing at 7 o'clock uh, in prayer time. Uh, the ladies' uh, prayer groups, you're alternating between Jennifer and, and Caitlin, and that is uh, the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month at 7 o'clock. And that's on Google Meet or Google Hangout. Okay, Google Meet, okay. Uh, today is ISC Sunday. We're part of ISCA International. Uh, it used to be the Independent Fundamental Church of America, and it just went to initials. Everything's initials now. You young people, when you post on Facebook, it's all initials. Whatever happened to the English language? <laughs> I said, that's right. That's right. FDR started this, right? You know, and so, so I said, I don't know what these initials mean, but it's all, it's a secret code. Anyways, IFCA Sunday, and, and so they, they have an exciting project they're going to expand on. We're going to take a look at a video in a moment. Uh, men's breakfast will be uh, March the 6th, 8 a.m., sign-up sheet in the foyer. And your end-of-the-year giving statements are on the back table. So uh, in case you're planning on doing your taxes this year or something, you know, so they're back there. Insert Church Around the World. I hope you're uh, reading the Church Around the World and glimpses a lot of good information in this. So we're going to see the IFCA uh, video and uh, the uh, new president or executive director, uh, Bargus, Richard Bargus. Hi, my name is Richard Bargus, and I'm the executive director of IFCA International. Thank you for taking some time to remember IFCA on what we call IFCA Sunday. We have a special love for the church because Jesus loves the church of Jesus Christ. This is a time when we set aside to think about the church in maybe some broader terms and the way that God works in different ways through different ministries and people and churches, all for the common cause. We work together because working together, we can accomplish more. We want to strengthen the local church. And that really is the heartbeat of IFCA International. Whether it's our individual members, pastors, missionaries, lay leaders, or our churches, or our organizations, which might include schools or missions agencies, um, or all kinds of other ministries. We may be doing different things in different ways, but we're all doing it in the same direction as we advance the cause of Christ. At IFCA, we do all kinds of things that might be a benefit to you as a Christian or as a church or ministry. We provide counsel and resources. One of the resources that we have is um, The Voice magazine. This is the newest edition of The Voice, and I would encourage you to pick this up. You can call our offices and we can send you out a copy of it. This one particularly is on advancing the cause we have all kinds of ministry leaders in this issue that are explaining how, whether it's uh, camps and conference centers or our chaplains in the hospitals, chaplains in the military, uh, women's ministry, youth ministry, how all of them together are working to advance the cause of Jesus Christ. We want to stand firm. We want to stand firm because we want to stand on sound doctrine. And we want to stand firm because we want to make sure that we are glorifying our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to stand firm because we know that in the day that we live in, apostasy is growing. There is not only the enemy outside, but there is the enemy within. Jesus told us it would be this way. And we can link arms together. We can stand side by side. We can preach the gospel to those that are lost. We can encourage one another and strengthen one another 
and counsel with one another and work hard together. I, I know that these are difficult days and I'm thankful for you being with us. But we also remember that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has promised that he's coming again. And that's an exciting thing to think about. So we want to be found faithful when he comes, whether that be tonight or whether that be in a year or five years or 10 years, Jesus is coming again. And so as we worship the Lord together, as we sing praises to our great God and Savior, as we think about all the things that he's given us to do, let us remember that it's all for him. It's all for his glory. We've asked you that if you can take a special offering today. Let me tell you what that offering is going to be used for. All the way back to the beginning of our history, even before that, we recognize that the teaching of the Word of God is paramount to everything we do. Bible institutes were set up uh, to train laymen as well as pastors and missionaries that would go out into the world and tell the world about Jesus Christ. The reason that that had to happen was because so many schools and churches had been liberalized in their theology. They had this destructive heresy that had come in and it made them a dangerous thing to continue to send our people to. And so the church recognized the need to continue to train. And so they built Bible institutes, Bible colleges, and seminaries. Well, there's plenty of those and they exist and they're very helpful to us and we're thankful for them. But IFCA has recognized that there is a need for lay level training and training in places where people can't travel. They can't afford tuition. So we're beginning something we're calling IFCA Bible Institute. Basically what it is, it's an online website where you can go and you can watch IFCA teachers teaching the word of God in different areas of theology or practical ministry. We've already built the website and we've already begun to put some uh, videos in there with uh, little notes to go along with the videos to help teach uh, the pastor or the elder or the deacon, our brothers and sisters that are all over the world in some places where they can get internet access on their phone, but they can't leave where they're ministering and where they're working and serving uh, to go to school for any length of time. We want to provide for all of these needs and we want to do it free. But the only way we can do that is if we have the funds to be able to continue to add to this small library of videos where we're hoping to teach the word of God to those that are in our churches, to those that need to be trained. We want to build up an army of Sunday school teachers and Awana leaders and good solid deacons and elders. And for the pastor that maybe needs a little brushing up on some things or sharpening in other areas, we want to provide that as well. It's a stepping stone to maybe another level of education. We want to help the church in this way. And this offering that we're collecting on IFCA Sunday is going to be used for that project. So if you're able to give however the Lord leads you, we want to thank you because you will be blessing the church in giving that way. Well, thank you for your time this morning and thank you for praying for me and for IFCA International as a whole. We know that the Lord is with us. We know that the Lord is carrying us. Although it may be some strange times that we're living in right now, God is with us and we will be successful. God bless you and have a great Lord's Day. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we cannot carry, we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. 
For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning. We give you thanks for your goodness to us. We thank you for the opportunity to be here together. Um, we ask that you would be with Pastor as he uh, preaches from your word this morning. Lord, speak to us through it. Help us to uh, be strengthened uh, here that we can carry with us uh, your word from this place to be a light in the world. Please accept worship from us this morning that is worthy of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Joe. All right, we'll continue our study in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. One of the... Uh, Sad and sometimes I think rather cruel things within the body of Christ is quite often they think of missionaries as moochinaries. And uh, pastors, there are pastors who uh, joke about the missionary handshake. <laughs> you know, you know. Um, but the truth is, God's people must support God's work. And pastors don't realize if it wasn't for the gracious giving of their own people, they wouldn't have a salary either. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so it's sad. It's hard enough to be a missionary. And most of the missionaries I know are under-supported, right? They really don't have enough coming in and they're scraping by. And so, the reason why I mention that, this is the second major passage in the scriptures dealing, uh, <clears throat> in the epistles dealing with giving. The first one is that huge section of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. But one of the great things, the Philippian church stands on top of the heap when it comes to lighting the way of how to support missions. So we pick it up here, Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, and it says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so we come to this point that the Philippians are first in mission support. I've heard many Missionaries come during conferences who preach about the church of Antioch that first sent out missionaries. But the Philippian church is the only church mentioned that once the missionaries went out, they sent gifts after the missionaries on the field. We have a saying, don't we? Out of sight, what? out of mind and quite often that's all too true with missionaries right they're out of sight we don't think about them they're out of mind now one of the major reasons for writing the book of philippians even though we've had some tremendous doctrine and teaching up to this point was a thank you note <laughs> at the very end of the book he's saying well thank you for your gift uh, not that I'm seeking a gift, but you have surprised me once again with your generosity. 
Matter of fact, we're told in Philippians 4.16, which we'll look at hopefully next week, is the fact, this is the third time they've done this. <laughs> they, they, they've sent a gift, and then they sent another one, and then they sent another one. And no other church, Paul says, verse 15 says, no other church has ever sent him any money after he had left the church. They would provision him and send him on his way, but... No other church, he says, has sent gifts afterwards. This actually sets the pattern. A mission support. You have two major passages in scriptures which sets the pattern for mission ports. Romans 10, right? How shall they hear unless they're what? Sent. And this one. These are mission-minded Christians. And so they've sent this. As a matter of fact, this church is so mission-minded that in 2 Corinthians 9-2, Paul tells Corinthians a year ago, the Macedonians were willing to give out of sacrifice. And this is a poor church. These are mostly retired Roman soldiers living on pensions. <laughs> They weren't given much. As a matter of fact, the Roman soldiers weren't given much even when they were soldiers. They were given uh, 50 denarii a month and the cost, they had to pay for their own uniform and provisions, which cost 50 denarii a month. <laughs> you didn't leave anything, right? And so, uh, so we have this, this poor church scraping together what they can to send a gift to Paul. Now the Philippian church therefore establishes this ongoing pattern of giving. And it's the only church in the New Testament that does so. Matter of fact, one of the major issues of Paul uh, writing to Corinthians, right? They were stingy. <laughs> And they were a wealthy church. It was one of these, uh, you know, they were at the right place at the right time, the Corinthians, because they would bring ships in to one side of the isthmus, and the Corinthians were the middleman taking the goods over to the other side of the isthmus between the Aegean and Adriatic Seas, and they got the fees going both ways. So it was a wealthy church. But the Philippians were not. And Paul commends them for their care and he rejoices with them. And he said, by the way, there's nothing more encouraging than you're out in some remote place and you get a care package from home, right? Uh, you know, if you ever watched any of the documentaries of uh, World War II soldiers, what were they looking forward to every day? Milk hall, right? Something from home. And uh, that was particularly true in uh, the boys in Vietnam. And so um, Paul gets a care package. And no other church, because a care package says, I'm really thinking of you and I really love you, right? And that's what a care package does. And, and so he was encouraged and, 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 and facing all the obstacles that Paul did, they show this care for them. And action is put into thought. By the way, the difference between will and action is your desire to fulfill the will. I want you to picture in your mind a triangle. Okay? Now, it could be scaling or, you know, equilateral or isosceles. But, uh, <laughs> and so... So I'm a little bit skewed. Anyway, a triangle. On the bottom side, you have over here, you have your will, what you want to do. Now, let's call it your spiritual will, okay? On the other side is the price to do the will. What is it going to cost you, right? What's it going to cost you? It's going to cost you, are you going to overcome your laziness and, 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 and sinful thoughts and, and, and your flesh and your lust? What's it going to cost you? At the very top is accomplishing your will. Your will to serve the Lord must overcome the cost to do it. Or you're not going to do it. 
Romans, uh, Luke chapter 14 says you've got to count the cost. Unless you're willing to count the cost, you're not going to do it. There might have been Christians in other churches that said, boy, we should send something to Paul. But they don't do it. Good intentions, right? Now, there's three people that try to do it and never make the top. One is a double-minded man, right? Get started, get started, and all of a sudden, and they don't do it. The second type is the guy who is overcome by his own flesh, right? The flesh he desire. And he doesn't make it to the top. Then the third type, which is so many of us, we become weary in what? Well-doing. That's part of the cost. The weariness, the, 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 the constant pressure, the distractions, my flesh. Unless your will is greater than the cost of doing your will, you're not going to accomplish anything for the Lord. So keep that triangle in your mind this week. Am I willing to pay the cost to do the will of God? That's the question. The Philippians were. They set aside, they sacrificed, they set aside. They, they were the ones who were willing to give to the Jerusalem saints. He said they were eager to give. They wanted Paul to give. He said, no, no, Paul said, I'll just collect him. When I come back through there, after I go to Corinth, I'll come back through and pick it up. He didn't have to twist their arms like the Corinthians. As a matter of fact, he used them, right? He said, listen, boy, the Macedonians spent every will in a year. I'm not to twist your arm, but, you know, sort of hint, hint. Are you going to let them put you to shame? Exactly. Fulfill your promise. He says, and I don't want any collections when I come. I want you already to have it ready. <laughs> you know, isn't it interesting? Often the most or the least able to give are the ones who give more generously. Isn't it often the truth? You notice God's work is usually not supported by a bunch of millionaires and billionaires. <laughs> it's the widow taking $25 a month out of her Social Security and sending to this missionary. Or, you know, the, the common worker coming there and send aside and delaying getting that car, delaying getting that you know, new television set so they could support this missionary project. That's why the Lord said that the widow gave more than all of them, even though two mites was two-thirds of a penny, he said, because she gave everything she had. <laughs> and so this is what the Philippians were about. They were a, a, a poor church. Uh, they, they did not have a lot of means, but they wanted to give. And Paul emphasizes that he knew all along the Philippians cared for him and desired to do more, but they lacked opportunity. There's a hint here, I think, Epaphrodite, when he shows up, he shows up and says, Paul, I'm sorry, we wanted, to, you know, we wanted to come earlier and we wanted to do more earlier, but we were delayed in doing it. Would you forgive us? Paul said, I wasn't expecting anything. <laughs> And I know you care about it. You, you didn't have to do this to prove your care because you've shown it over and over and over again. Now here's a key principle of serving the Lord and supporting God's work is you want to do more. You do something, but you really want to do more. Well, how can I do more? Lord, what, what, what are you going to allow me to do that I might be faithful in supporting this work? Now, Paul says, don't get me wrong. I, you know, I greatly appreciate your gift, but I am not depending on people giving things. I'm depending on the Lord and the fact that I am not relying upon other people. The Lord will provide in his way and his needs. And by the way, we're going to see, we're going to see this in the next passage. He says, by the way, you know, you're the one that's going to be rewarded for this, not me. It's great that you give to me, but you're, you're going to be rewarded. So when you give them to the mission work, all the missionary work that they're doing with your support behind them, you're credited with that. 
Every soul they reach, everyone they touch. And so Paul says, I'm not looking for this gift. I am serving the Lord to please him. I'm not looking for gain or money, but I praise the Lord that you have done this. You've done a good thing. Now, Paul said he learned to be content. Now, just think of what Paul was before he got saved, right? He was a Pharisee. He had everything, right? He, he never went home and said, man, I wonder what I, if I have any food to eat today. I mean, he had, a, he had all that he needed. He, you know, he had a horse, remember? He was heading up to Damascus. He had uh, a claim, you know, people looked up to him. And, and you know, is everything else. He, he had clothes. He didn't, there wasn't anything that Paul needed that he lacked. Now, he went from that to depending on how the Lord would supply through God's people. He's often hungry, often slept on ground. Take a look at that list over there in 2 Corinthians 11, you know. And not only did he lack, but, you know, this guy was whipped, scourged five times and beaten with rods three times. I mean, uh, this guy, this would not be how you would, uh, you know, post uh, your resume on career.com, right? We're looking for a guy who wants to be beaten up and, you know, whipped and scourged, and, you know. But that's exactly what he went through. And so, but Paul says he never lacked what he needed, food or shelter. And if he didn't need food that day, he didn't get food that day. And he had little food, sometimes no food. He was sleeping on the ground on the side of the road. As a Pharisee, he could sleep in any inn or any house that he wanted to, but here he's sleeping on the ground and, and in the side of the road, and he's having this rough life. And Paul trusts that the Lord would take care of him for what the Lord orders he pays for. And so Paul said, I learned to be good. Now, I want you to notice this. There's two words I want you to zero in on here. He learned. It wasn't natural, right? It's awful hard to, when you're used to having everything, to learn to do without. It's not an easy transition. He learned it. Secondly, he learned to be content. The word content here, satisfied, comes from two Greek words, autarkos, auto, and arcus. Auto is self. If you have an automobile, it's a self-driving vehicle. You don't need a horsey or an ox or anything else. It's, it's a, it's a self-driving vehicle. Well, actually, we know there's gasoline and everything and all that in there, but it's, it's an automobile, which was quite a sensation at the turn of the 20th century. The word arches, you're familiar with that too, it means to rule. Uh, monarchy, right? Uh, democracy, uh, uh, these uh, oligarchy, these archy things at the end of the things, that's, that's from this word. That means I am, have myself under control. I have under my control. I am not looking for anything outside. The Lord is providing and I'm not begging someone to support me. <laughs> I'm complete within myself. Not because Paul was self-sufficient, because he was God-sufficient, right? That's what he was looking for. He was looking to be God-sufficient. And so Paul was not claiming that he can do without anyone. He, used to, he was satisfying whatever the Lord gave him. By the way, that's just, that's foreign to us. We go, you know, p most people think that food's grown in a can. It just appears on the shelf. I mean, that uh, AOC thing, right? She was surprised that you put seeds in the ground and look, there's lettuce coming up. I mean, oh, you know, I mean, why, well, you know? <laughs> Or she was terrified of garbage disposal too, but that's another issue. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, we don't think that God thank you for those who grew this food and those who processed this food and those who canned this food and those who transported this food. It was all you doing this. We just go in and pick it up and we're off. Man, they're out of the thing I wanted, right? 
with a grocery store full of food that you neither sowed, nor harvested, nor packaged, nor delivered. You just go and God has it on the shelf there for you. And he provided you the funds to go buy it. I mean, our big things, name brand, store brand. You know, we do. But here Paul didn't have that. He couldn't go into a grocery store and pick up food. And Paul said, I learned to be content. Could we, we be content with that? <laughs> Satisfied? Would you be satisfied if you go to the grocery store and all the shelves are empty? Or the fact that your job is cut off, your funds are cut off, and you can't afford food? Or have to wait into a, uh, with a food line? Paul was content. He, was, he had well-being because he knew that God was carrying him all the way. And so Paul was coming to and says, I praise God for what you've done, but I am not depending on what you're doing. Paul said, I learned how to be hungry and to have plenty. Um, Paul never had to check into EPI weight loss services. <laughs> Never had to. In fact, I remember a missionary years ago coming in Africa. He had to explain what gluttony was because the concept to them to have too much food just didn't make sense. I mean, it's a place where you come from to have too much food? Man, we don't know what blessings we have, or do we? We really don't. We might find out one day, though. And so here we have, Paul knew how to go hungry. He didn't despair for lacking. He didn't want to, Lord, what am I going to do? He wasn't pacing the floor. He didn't have to take blood pressure medication. <laughs> he didn't become hawkly self-sufficient either. Ha ha, I don't need you. It wasn't that idea, but Paul was able to trust God no matter what state he was in. And by the way, he was consistent whether he had plenty or didn't have anything. He was consistent in his praise to God. He was consistent in his attitude. He did not become self-reliant. He relied upon the Lord, nor did he become in despair when he didn't have anything. Most People do not know how to prosper. Don't know how to flourish. We drift away from the Lord. Uh, Joshua prospered at Jericho and, and forgot to talk to the Lord before he went to Ai. <laughs> or deal with the Gibeonites. David was feeling pretty good, right? He was, the kingdom was all established. He had everything he wanted. He decides he sends Joab and the gang out there <laughs> to fight the next battle at Rabbah. And he's just going to take, sit and take his ease in Zion, literally. Because <laughs> that's where he was on Mount Zion. <laughs> His mind drifts from the Lord as he's considering all these wonderful things and he spots beautiful Bathsheba taking a bath. <laughs> and that was not a good day in the life of David. <laughs> or in the kingdom. And so it wasn't consistent. Yuza, everything was going so great for King Yuza uh, that, I mean Uzziah, not Uzziah, Uzziah guys who killed with the Ark of Covenant, but Uzziah. Everything was going so well, he was bored. <laughs> Everything going so well, bored, right? <laughs> he decides he's going to make a sacrifice in the temple. Ah, I haven't done that. <laughs> God strikes him down with leprosy. See, it's awful hard to learn how to be prosperous and to have plenty. We tend to become self-reliant. We tend to complain that well, I want more. I want something different. Prosperity is more of a snare to us than poverty is a burden. You must understand that. The greatest temptation is not in 
the times when we're under pressure, it's in the times when things are going very well. And Paul said, I learned how to do both. I learned how to be consistent whether I was lacking something or whether I was full. It didn't matter. I was consistent with that. And Paul states, because of this, I can do all things in Jesus Christ who makes me strong. Now, people lift this out of context. <laughs> It doesn't mean that Paul can leap high, tall buildings in a single bound. <laughs> or do move mountains. Or it, that's not what he's talking about. Paul is talking about the whole epistle that he, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And that he who began a good work in me will complete to end. And he's working out of salvation with fear and trembling. He's doing all things without murmuring and grumbling. That he had put crowned everything that he was before is done and now is everything's relying on Jesus Christ. He's pressing on the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. It's, it's the fact that he learned to be content. He's rejoicing in the Lord always that he let in his, his gracious difference between all the men. He's, he's making his prayer request with thanksgiving and supplication before the Lord. He's thinking on the things that are good and right and virtuous and honorable. He's doing all these things. He's learned to be content. He said, now I can do all things in Jesus Christ who strengthens me. It all presumes everything that comes before. In other words, he says, I can do everything that Jesus Christ wants me to do. Not because of who I am, but because of who he is. And if I submit to who he is, there's nothing I can't do and what he's called me to do. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about, I can do all things to Jesus Christ, so I can just dream up that God's going to give me this money, I'm going to go buy a big car, you know? It's not what it's talking about. And so he's trying to teach the Philippians, says, yes, it's great you give me a gift, but I'm not depending on that. And it's more to your benefit than it is actually to me. By the way, one of the things, uh, let, me, let me explain this word we use in theology called, in philosophy called redactionism. You know what redactionism is? You bring things to such a simple term that it actually misses the whole point. <laughs> it's oversimplified. So everybody, you look at all in the scripture and say, that means everything. Oh, oh, oh. Well, sometimes it does. All sin comes short of glory. God means what? Everyone. But when you go over to, for example, to 1 Timothy 6.10, where it says that the love of money is the root of all evil, well, we know that's not true. It's all manner of evil because there's lust, right? And there's power and there's, and, and, and there's all kinds of other desires, laziness, and all kinds of things that are motivation to sin. We sin because we're sinners. Isn't that profound? <laughs> So in some cases, it means all manner of things, all, all of us are the same kind. So, and Joe, that's why I had you read, you know, from that passage that, you know, we have to take a look at the context. What do you mean by all? For example, when Paul said that he preached to all creatures under heaven and earth, did he preach to everybody? Well, no, everybody he came across that would hear him, he said, in other words, all manner of people I preach to, we still don't have everybody preached to, do we? <laughs> and so you got to look at the context here. But Paul is saying, listen, if I am content and rejoicing whether things are going well, and by the way, I, I don't want this to sound... Um, sound like I'm minimizing what our country's going through, but Paul didn't care about politics. <laughs> yeah, we, we grieve over what's happening in our country and we need to stay in the battle. But he didn't worry about it because God's in control of all things. This too shall pass away. Ecclesiastes 5.8 says this. Do not marvel when the poor are oppressed because they too have a judge who is in heaven who will bring it to account everything you see now is going to be brought to account 
to a God that does not lie, sees all things, and judge things justly with holiness. <coughs> and so Paul learned to be content, not worry about things, that he was going to continue on serving the Lord no matter what the cost no matter what comes to me, whether he had food or not food, whether he knew where he's going to sleep or not, whether he's being persecuted or not, he said, I learned to be content. Because all things come down for the glory of God, and however he wants to use me, it's just fine with me. Because with Paul, to live it's for Christ to die is gain. Amen. Is it with you? Are you content today in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. The gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in the Word this morning. We pray, Lord, that as we come to a conclusion of our service today, Lord, that will draw ever closer to you. That will be content. Not in our spiritual growth. We need to move forward. But content in the fact that you're leading and directing us. And that whatever your will is in our life, whether it's in good health or bad health, whether it's in prosperity or poverty, or whether it is with tranquility or trials, all things are brought down before the throne of God to us that we might be able to serve you effectively for your glory. May that be the desire of everyone here, that they might be content in you, serving you, and casting all the cares upon you, that in all things, You'll be glorified in and through us, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.